I know how grateful the President is, and we all are. And let me close by saying, as all of our experts have said many times, while the threat of serious illness to the average American from the coronavirus remains low, every American can do your part to reduce the burden on your health, on your family, the burden on our health care system, and especially the threat to the most vulnerable among us by putting into practice the President's 15 days to slow the spread. And as the President said at the outset of his remarks, uh, I know that millions of Americans are doing that just now, and the greatness of the American character is shining forth. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. You had a call with Senator Schumer. He says you've now agreed to invoke the Defense Production Act to actually make those medical supplies that hospitals say are in severe shortage. So two questions. Is that what you're doing now? Uh, it is. I did it yesterday. Uh, we invoked it, I think, the day before we signed it, the evening of the day before, uh, and uh, invoked it yesterday. We have a lot of people working very hard to do ventilators and various other things. So yes. you're using it now to tell businesses we are they using need to make it. ventilators, masks, are, respirators? For, for certain uh, things that we need, okay. including, uh, including some of the very important emergency. I would say ventilators, probably more masks. Uh, to a large extent. We have millions of masks which are coming and which will be distributed to the states. The states are having a hard time getting them, so we, uh, we're using the Act. The Act is very good for things like this. We have millions of masks that we've ordered. They will be here soon. We're having them shipped directly to states. So you said you would only — you were signing this but not invoking it. This is what you said yesterday, and that you would only do so in a worst-case scenario. Yeah. So are we now Last, in a worst-case scenario? Uh, we — we need — no, it's, it's no different other than we need certain equipment that the states are unable to get by themselves. So we're invoking it to use the powers of the federal government to help the states get things that they need, like the masks, like the ventilators. Yes, Steve? Given what uh, Governor Cuomo has done in, in New York, uh, is there any more consideration to a national lockdown to keep people in their homes? I don't think so. Uh, uh, essentially, you've done that in California. You've done that in New York. Those are really two hotbeds. Those are probably the two hottest of them all in terms of hot spots. Uh, I don't think so, because you go out to the Midwest, you go out to other locations, and uh, they're watching it on television, but they don't have the same problems. They don't have, by, by any means, the same problem. Uh, New York, California, Miami, the governor's doing an excellent job, Governor DeSantis uh, in Florida. Uh, we have some pretty hot spots in Florida, too. But we're uh, general — and the state of Washington, of course. But that was largely — if you look at it, it was one nursing home that had problems like you wouldn't believe. So, no, we're uh, working with the governors, and uh, I don't think you'll — I don't think we'll ever find that necessary. So we're about a week into your 15-day guidelines. Are you happy with the progress? Would you like to see uh, — I am happy. I am happy it. with it. Uh, we'll have to see what the results are at the end of 14 days, let's say. We'll know by the 15th day to see what we do. Uh, but I'm certainly uh, honored by the way the American people are working, because it's work. It's work not to work. This is the first time this has ever happened. And we're working out a tremendous financial package for them so they don't work. Whoever heard of this? Usually you work out a financial package to get people working. We're asking people not to work. Social distancing, a new term that's become probably the hottest term there is. So, uh, no, I'm very honored by the way the American people are are uh, taking this, I mean, so seriously. Yes, Jim? Mr. President, a uh, question for you and a question for Dr. Fauci, if I could. <clears throat> There's been some concern among Democrats on Capitol Hill that the Phase Three fiscal stimulus is weighted too much in favor of corporations and not enough in terms of individuals. Uh, what did your conversations with Senator Schumer yield on that front? Well, I think that really all of that is being discussed right now. We talked about uh, as an example, buyback, stock buybacks. I don't want to have stock buybacks. I don't want people spending — I don't want some executive saying we're going to buy 200,000 shares of stock. I want that money to be used for the workers and also for the company, to keep the company going, but not for buybacks. I would uh, — I mean, I haven't spoken to a lot of the Republicans or Democrats on it. We discussed it. And I, I don't like buybacks. I didn't like them the first time. You and Senator Schumer. So we're, we're, we're discussing. We're discussing that. We're discussing many things. Are you on the same page with Senator Schumer? Uh, we're not so far away. I tell you, we're not very. We're not very far away. And to Dr. Fauci, if I could, Dr. Fauci, uh, as was explained yesterday, there has been some promise with hydroxychloroquine, this potential therapy for people who are infected with coronavirus. 
Is there any evidence to suggest that, as with malaria, it might be used as a prophylaxis yeah. against COVID-19? No, the, the answer is is no. And and the the evidence that you're talking about, John, is anecdotal evidence. So as the commissioner of FDA and the president mentioned yesterday, we're trying to strike a, a balance between making something with a potential of an of an effect uh, to the American people available at the same time that we do it under the auspices of a protocol that would give us information to determine if it's truly safe and truly effective. But the information that you're referring to specifically is anecdotal. It was not done in a controlled clinical trial, so you really can't make any definitive statement about it. I think uh, I'm, without uh, seeing too much, I'm probably more of a fan of that than uh, maybe than anybody. But I'm a big fan, and we'll see what happens. And uh, we all understand what the doctor said is 100 percent correct. It's early. But uh, we've, uh, you know, I've seen things that are uh, impressive. And we'll see. We're going to know soon. We're going to know soon, In including safety. But, you know, when you get that safety, this has been prescribed for many years for people to combat malaria, which was a big problem. And it's very effective. It's a strong, it's a strong drug. So we'll see. Effective against SARS. It was a very. It was, as I understand that. I is that a correct statement? It was fairly effective on SARS. John, you've got to be careful when you say fairly effective. It was never done in a clinical trial. They compared it to anything. It was given to individuals and felt that maybe it worked. So, you've, but was there anything to compare it to? Yeah, well, that's the point. Whenever you do a clinical trial, you do standard of care versus standard of care plus the agent you're evaluating. That's the reason why we showed back in Ebola why particular uh, uh, interventions worked. Sir, on that topic. Sir, on Mr. President. Mr. President. About the possible therapies yesterday, Mr. President, you said that they were for, quote, immediate delivery, immediate. We heard yeah, from we're Dr. ordering, uh, yes, we have uh, uh, millions of units ordered. Uh, Bayer is one of the companies, as you know, big company, very big, very uh, great company. Uh, millions of units are ordered, and we're going to see what happens. We're going to be uh, talking to the governors about it, and the FDA is working on it right now. Uh, the advantage is that it has been prescribed for a totally different problem, but it has been described for many years, and everybody knows the levels of, of uh, the, the negatives and the positives. But I will say that uh, I am a man that comes from a very positive school when it comes to, in particular, one of these drugs. And we'll see how it works out, Peter. I'm not, I'm not saying it will, but I, I think uh, that uh, people may be surprised. By the way, that would be a game changer. But we're going to know very soon. But, but we have ordered millions of units. It's being ordered by, from Bayer. And there is another couple of companies also that, that do it. For clarity, Dr. Fauci said there is no magic drug for coronavirus right now, which you would agree. I guess on this issue, well, we'll, 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 I, I think we only is disagree a little bit. That, sorry. I disagree. Uh, Maybe and maybe not. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. We have to see. Is We're going to know. That, is, it possible, is it possible that your impulse to put a positive spin on things may be giving Americans a false sense of hope? No, I don't think so. The preparedness think so. right now. No, I don't think so. I think that, uh, I think it's got, you know, no, the not yet approved drug. I mean, such a lovely question. Uh, look, it may work and it may not work. And I agree with the doctor what he said. May work, may not work. Uh, I feel good about it. That's all it is, just a feeling. I, you know, I'm a smart guy. I feel good about it. And we're going to see. You're going to see soon enough. And we have certainly some very big samples of people. If you look at the people, you have a lot of people that are in big trouble. And uh, this is not a drug that, obviously, uh, I think I can speak for a lot of from a lot of experience because it's been out there for over 20 years. So it's not a drug that you have a huge amount of danger with. It's not like a brand new drug that's been just created that may have an unbelievable monumental effect, like kill you. Uh, we're going to know very soon. And I can tell you, the FDA is working very hard to get it out. Right now, in terms of malaria, if you want it, you can have a prescription. You get a prescription. And by the way, and it's very effective. It works. Uh, I have a feeling you may and, — and I'm not being overly optimistic or pes pessimistic. I sure as hell think we ought to give it a try. I mean, there's been some interesting things happened and some good, very good things. Uh, let's see what happens. We have nothing to lose. You know the expression? What the hell do you have to lose? Okay. So what do you say to Americans are nearly 200 dead? What do you say to Americans were scared, though? I guess nearly 200 dead. 
14,000 who are sick, millions, as you witness, who are scared right now. What do you say to Americans who are watching you right now who are scared? Uh, I say that you're a terrible reporter. That's what I say. Go ahead. I think it's a very nasty question, and I think it's a very bad signal that you're putting out to the American people. The American people are looking for answers, and they're looking for hope. And you're doing sensationalism, and uh, the same with NBC and Comcast. I don't call it, I don't call it Comcast. I call it Comcast. Let me just ask for whom you work. Let me just say something. That's really bad reporting. And you ought to get back to reporting instead of sensationalism. Let's see if it works. It might and it might not. I happen to feel good about it, but who knows? I've been right a lot. Let's see what happens, John. Can I get back to the science and the logistics? You're be ashamed the, of the, the units that were ordered, are they for clinical trials or are they for distribution to the general patient uh, population? We are going to, as I understand it, we are going to be taking samples in New York. Governor Cuomo very much is interested in this drug, uh, and they are going to work on it also after they get a certain approval. We're waiting for one final approval from the FDA. We'll see what happens. But we'll use it on people that are not doing great or even at the beginning of so not feeling well. Sort of fallen under the and, John, what do we have to lose? So this it's, wait, of, John, it's been out there for so long. We hear good things. Let's see. Maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. I understand all that. I'm just thinking the application here. So that would be under sort of a modified compassionate access? We're doing that, I guess, and that's, that's what it's called, yeah. Yes? I, I would like, Dr. Fauci, if you don't mind, uh, to follow up on what the president is saying. Should Americans have hope in this drug right yeah. now? And, sir, I, I would like to follow up on Peter's question here. Could you please issue, uh, address Americans in this country who are scared right now? This is a very valid concern that people have. No, there really isn't that much of a difference in many respects with what we're saying. The president feels optimistic about something, his feeling about it. What I'm saying is that it might, it might be effective. I'm not saying that it isn't. It might be effective, but as a scientist, as we're getting it out there, we need to do it in a way as while we are making it available for people who might want the hope that it might work, you're also collecting data that will ultimately show that it is truly effective and safe under the conditions of COVID-19. So there really isn't different. It's just a question of how one feels about it. Is there any reason to believe it's not safe? Well, certainly as a drug, any drug, John, has some toxicities. The decades of experience that we have with this drug indicate that the toxicities are rare and they are, in many respects, reversible. What we don't know is when you put it in the context of another disease, whether it's safe. Fundamentally, I think it probably is going to be safe. But I like to prove things first. So it really is a question of not a lot of difference. It's the hope that it will work versus proving that it will work. So I don't see big differences here. I agree. Sir, Mr. your President. message to Americans who are working at home, who have their children in their homes right now, who are homeschooling, doctors who say they don't have the masks they need to do their jobs, your message to them? My message to the American people is that uh, there is a very low incidence of death. You understand that. And uh, we're going to come through this stronger than ever before. Uh, if you get it, if you happen to get it, uh, it is highly unlikely. It's looking like it's getting to a number that's much smaller than people originally thought in terms of the ultimate, uh, uh, the ultimate problem, which would be death. Uh, my message to the American people is, number one, you've done an incredible job, incredible, what you've gone through. It's been incredible. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't the fault of 140 other countries where this has happened. Uh, and there is tremendous hope. And I think we're going to come out stronger, better, bigger in every way. I think we're going to be a better country than we were before. And we learned a lot. We learned on reliance, who to rely on, who not to rely on. But our country, uh, our country has been incredible, the way they pulled together, including the fact that I just spoke to Senator Schumer. We had a wonderful conversation. We both want to get to a good solution. But it's been it really, for me, watching and seeing people that weren't speaking, getting along well, because we all have one common aim, and that's to get rid of this invisible enemy, get rid of it fast, and then go back to the kind of economy that we had, and maybe even better. Yeah, please, in the back. Um, no, in the back, please. Uh, Mr. President, uh, two questions, if you'll indulge me. 
The first question is, many small businesses are concerned that they have weeks, not months, and are worried about how long it'll take. We're going to be helping them a lot. We're going to be focused, a big focus, and including my conversation with both Mitch and with Chuck, a big focus of that conversation with small businesses, because they are really the engine behind our country, more so than the big ones. They are the engine behind our country. Second, if I may, sir, are you concerned about members of Congress that may have used information they learned on updates to sell stocks and profit off of this? I'm not aware of it. Uh, I saw some names. I'm not. I know all of them. Uh, I know uh, everyone mentioned uh, Diane Feinstein, I guess, and and. Uh, couple of others. I, I don't know too much about what it's about, but I find them to all be very honorable people. That's all I know. And they, and they said they did nothing wrong. I, I find them, the whole group, very honorable people. Yeah, please. Hello, Mr. President. So the whole group would include Richard Burr, the head of the Intelligence Committee, and it also would include Senator Kelly Loeffler. And so the question is whether or not they should be investigated for that behavior. Well, it also includes Dianne Feinstein, a Democrat. You didn't mention her name. Why didn't you mention her name? And I think she's a very honorable person, by the way. So I'm not saying, but so you know, it's senator, interesting that you senator, mentioned two people, so but you don't mention one that happens to be a Democrat. Senator, any senator, should they be I, I don't know, because I'd have to look at it. Possibly, but I find them to be honorable people. Yeah. You said the other day you compare yourself, you see yourself as a wartime president right now, leading the country through this pandemic that we're experiencing. Do you really think, you know, going off on Peter, going off on a network is appropriate when the country is going through something like I this? I do, because I think uh, Peter is, uh, you know, I've dealt with Peter for a long time. And I think Peter is uh, not a good journalist when it comes to fairness message to the country. Oh, I think it's a good message Peter. because I think that the country has to understand that there is indeed, whether we like it or not, and some of the people in this room won't like it, uh, there's a lot of really great news and great journalism, and there's a lot of fake news out there. And I hear it all, and I see it all, and I understand it all because I'm in the midst of it. So when somebody writes a story or does a story on television, and I know it's false, I know it's fake, and when they say they have 15 sources have said, and I know there's no sources, there's no sources, they just make it up. Uh, I know that, and I call Peter, I call Peter out, but I call other people out too. And you know, this is time to come together, but coming together is much harder when we have dishonest journalists. It's a very important profession that you're in. It's a profession that I think is incredible. I cherish it. But when people are dishonest, they truly do hurt our country. Yeah, in the back. President, Please, go ahead. President. Mr. President, China has been in communication with the United States and also WHO about coronavirus. Right, that's true. that's true. And the U.S. shut its border uh, to travelers from China on uh, February the 2nd. Also, Wuhan has been in lockdown since January the 24th. And this all happened almost two months ago. Why did you still say um, if if you could have known it earlier? And also, you have been calling coronavirus. Well, I have to say this. We have, and I, I can speak for myself, but uh, I have a very good relationship with China and with President Xi. I have great respect for President Xi. I consider him to be a friend of mine. Uh, it's unfortunate that this got out of control. It came from China. It got out of control. Some people are upset. I know. Uh, I know President Xi, uh, I, he loves China. He respects the United States. And I have to say, I respect China greatly, and I respect President Xi. Okay? That's more about stock buybacks. Many of the airlines and Boeing did stock buybacks. Is this a deal breaker for you in this? No, but it, uh, I never liked stock buybacks from their standpoint. When we did a big tax cut, and when they took the money and did buybacks, that's not building a hangar. That's not buying aircraft. That's not doing the kind of things that I want them to do. And we're now talking about buybacks. We didn't think we would have had to restrict it because we thought they would have known better. But they didn't know better. In some cases, not in all cases, obviously. Some people did an incredible job. They built plants all over the country. I mean, you'd see what's happened. I mean, we were doing, until this invisible enemy appeared, uh, we were, I mean, we never had an economy like this, but there were some companies that used that money to buy back stock, driving up the price of the stock artificially in many cases. I don't like that. I don't like it. And as far as whether or not we'll have that, allow them, when we give them money, because we have to keep these great companies in business because of the workers, frankly, for the most part, because of the workers. The workers are my number one concern. 
But the way we take care of the workers is we have to keep the companies going. I am fine with restricting buybacks. In fact, I would — I would demand that there be no stock buybacks. I don't want them taking hundreds of millions of dollars and buying back their stock, because that does nothing. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you very much. Uh, one for Dr. Fauci, and then hopefully one yeah, for you. Sure. And, and uh, one thing, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo is extremely busy, so if you have any question for him right now, could you do that? Because you know what I'd like to do? I'd like him to go back to the State Department, or as they call it, the Deep State Department, if you don't mind. I'd like to have him go back and uh, do his job. So, does anybody have any question? Please. Mr. Secretary, can I ask you to you want to call somebody? Yeah, how about you? Only for the secretary. The exemptions on work travel, uh, can you define that? Is all work, anyone with a work visa can still cross the border? Can you define yeah, what well, the, the measures that you're taking? That's a great question. Uh, we're, we're working we, – we're very con real concerned about H-2A visas, in particular agricultural workers need to, need to get across. We're going to make sure that we do everything we can to keep that part of our economic lifeblood working between our two countries. DHS and the State Department will work together. Uh, we want to make sure and keep commerce between Canada, the United States, and Mexico alive, functional, and prepared for the day that this economy bounces back like we expect that it will. Secretary, uh, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary um, the Mexican government has not announced any travel ban on Europe. Uh, where have you been in touch with them as to when they're going to do this and what it is that they're telling you? And then a second question, they also are telling us and said in a press conference this morning that they will not take back any non-Mexican citizen, any other third parties will have to, we don't know what will happen to them. So can you address what will happen to those third uh, country immigrants that you are saying that will not be allowed to enter the U.S. and Mexico is saying that they will not be allowed to stay in Mexico either or sent back from the U.S.? If I may, I'll, I'll take the first one and then Chad, I'll, I'll give you the second one. With respect to travel into Mexico from my side, I spoke with Foreign Minister Abrard a couple of times about this. I'm very confident we're going to get to a really good place that protects the Mexican people and the American people from those who might be traveling into places where we've got uh, designations, the Schengen Zone from China, so that they're not coming into Mexico and then coming into the United States. I'm very confident we'll do that and we'll make that announcement uh, shortly together. And again, as we implement the CDC's order, uh, again, we're going to take a number of individuals that cross the border illegally uh, and repatriate them or remove them quickly back to Mexico back to the Northern Triangle and back to any other country. So we're going to do that in a rapid fashion. We'll continue to work with Mexico uh, to make sure that Mexican nationals go back as well as other populations. But are you sending Guatemalans back to Guatemala or Cubans back to Cuba? What would you do with yes. those third countries that are not Mexicans? So we're doing all of the above. Uh, we're going to be sending, again, individuals back to Mexico, individuals back to the Northern Triangle countries, Cuba, Haiti, all of the, we, again, 122 different nations. Uh, that we see nationalities that come across that border. We'll be sending them back individually to their countries, but also with wor working with Mexico to send additional populations back there as well. And just to put it, you know, when you said before, you said uh, uh, the non-Mexicans going to Mexico. We're not sending them to Mexico. We're sending them back to their own countries, not to Mexico. Why would Mexico take people that aren't from Mexico? We're sending them back, in the case of Guatemala, Honduras, uh, El Salvador, a lot of other countries, they go back to the country from where they came. Okay, and um, Mike, Secretary please. Uh, Secretary Pompeo, yes, on sir. the issue of disinformation, is there any particular locus for this disinformation or is it diffuse? It's pretty diffused, unfortunately, uh, but we've certainly seen it come from places like China and Russia and Iran, where there are coordinated efforts to uh, disparage uh, what America is doing and an activity to, uh, to do all the things that President Trump has set in motion here. Other than what you're doing this morning, what are you doing to fight back? Lots of things. Lots of work. One of the things we want to make sure is the American people go to trusted sources for that information. Um, but we've made clear, we've spoken to these countries directly, that uh, we don't, that they need to knock it off, that we don't approve of it. And then there are a handful of other things we're engaged in to make sure that the right information is out there and accurate information is given. This, this idea uh, uh, of transparency and accurate information is very important. It's how we protect American people from something like this ever happening again. Mr. Secretary, Peace Corps you want the American Sorry. people to be coming to trusted sources of information. Does it undermine you at all when the president stands up here and he attacks news outlets calling us untrustworthy? Does anybody else have a question? The Peace Corps, Corps volunteers have all have the sort of the Peace Corps volunteers. Secretary, in Please. terms of Americans who find themselves stranded in places where there are no longer flights to get back to the United States, what efforts are being made to help them? I appreciate that question. So uh, we're doing lots of things. 
We've had uh, a couple places in particular, Peru and Morocco. I think we've had the first two, maybe three now flights out of Morocco. Uh, we're we're going to work to get people back. We're urging individuals when they can get back on their own. They, they travel there on their own. When they can get back there on their own, they ought to try to do that. Um, but we are we have a team stood up at the State Department, uh, the Repatriation Task Force, that is working each of these instances. So we've heard from individuals, members of Congress. Uh, we're trying to get Americans back from these places where air travel has been disrupted. And, I, and we'll get that done over time. We'll get it done successfully. Do you have any sense of how big that problem ahead, is? How long is? Is there any sense of just how big that problem is? How many people? We don't, know the, we don't know the full scale of it yet, but we think we have the largest number identified, and we're, we're working. If there are the, the, those who are watching that are someplace, and uh, you can get you can go on the State Department website, you can log in to, I think it's step.gov, you can go to step and uh, log in, and we'll we'll track it, and we'll try to get everybody back just as best we can. How long are these border restrictions likely to last along the south and north borders? Uh, well, they'll last as long as we need to do it to protect the American people from the virus. I, I, I couldn't tell you how long it's going to last. We have you. Have you determined whether Iran is responsible for that rocket attack last week? So maybe we shouldn't say. That. So let me just let me just get back to you on the answer to that. And what what we can what, yeah, what we know we, plenty. What, what we can say what we can say with certainty is this: we we've made clear all along that the Iraqi Shia militias are funded, trained, equipped by the Iranians. And we've urged the Iranians not to do that, and we've told the Iranians that they will be held responsible for those attacks when they threaten American lives. So, the, Peace Corps, the, Peace Corps volunteers, the Peace Corps volunteers that are in 60-plus countries, have they all been returned? You know, I don't know if they're all back or not yet. I know that they were directed to come back. I know that most of them are back. I couldn't tell you if we have all of them back yet. And then Secretary, Secretary Esper's not here, but to get uh, tests to the troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, are you able to give us a progress report on the status of that if they're all able to get tests? I don't know the answer to that. I know we have State Department officials, too, who are concerned, want to make sure we get them tests, our team as well, and we're working on that. We've had uh, significant success on that to date. There are a few places we've not been able to get them, but we, we will. We'll get them there. How exactly are you going to get those Americans back, and do you have any plans to get the military involved in that? We're going to use all the tools we can. These first efforts are combined commercial, private flights uh, that will fly in, bring them back, bring them back to a destination here in the United States, so we'll do that. There are some that will travel back uh, other ways as well. And we've worked with the Department of Defense to say where there is space available, we'll be able to bring them back on those flights as well. It's a whole government effort to make sure we get them back. They're going to they're gonna help us every place they can. Secretary Nesper, I've talked about it a couple times. Thank you, Secretary. A uh, question on Iran again. Is there any consideration to relax some sanctions on Iran during the coronavirus crisis that's been particularly hard hit? That's an important question. The, the whole world should know that humanitarian assistance into Iran is wide open. It's not sanctioned. We've offered to provide assistance to the Iranians as well. I talked with Dr. Tedros from the World Health Organization about this. Uh, we're doing everything we can to facilitate both the humanitarian assistance moving in and to make sure that financial transactions connected to that can take place as well. There is no sanction on medicines going to Iran. There's no sanctions on humanitarian assistance going into that country. They've got a terrible problem there, and we want that humanitarian medical health care assistance to get to the people of Iran. But the sanctions themselves, no, no movement. We are, we, are, we are working to do all the things we've had in place for the first three years here to deliver security for the American people. They know the answer. Iran. They know the answer. Iran. The leaders. They know the answer to your question. Wasn't it appropriate for the president to call your department the deep state department at a time when thousands of diplomats are working very hard around the world to combat this pandemic? I've worked with the president for three years now. I know how much he values the people that work on my team. I know when I was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency how much he valued the work we did. I know that he watches our team, Dr. Brooks, all the team that's working to push back against this virus to keep America safe. I know how much he values them. What a good answer. Yes, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Very true, too. Go ahead. No, behind you. I apologize. Please, go ahead. I have two questions. The first to Secretary Pompeo. The news hours learned that the CDC picked up that there was some sort of virus happening in Wuhan, the coronavirus happening in Wuhan, as early as December. When did the CDC start letting other agencies know that there was something in China happening, that this coronavirus was happening? And then when did the whole government approach ha start to happen? So I'll let the CDC or Dr. Fauci, you want to talk to that? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Secretary Azar, please. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so we were alerted by some discussions that Dr. Redfield, the director of the CDC, had with Chinese colleagues on January 3rd. It's since been known that there may have been cases in December, not that we were alerted in December. 
Excuse me, we'll do it in a second. Let Mike have May, may, just, may just say one more thing. There, there's been some discussion about China and what they knew and when they knew it. And I've, I've been very critical. We, we, we need to know immediately. The world is entitled to know. The Chinese government was the first to know of this risk to the world. And that puts a special obligation to make sure that data, the data gets to our scientists, our professionals. This is not about retribution. This matters going forward. We're in a, we're in a live exercise here to get this us, right. We, we need to make sure that even today the data sets that are available to every country, including data sets that are available to the Chinese Communist Party, are made available to the whole world. It's, a, it's an imperative to keep people safe. We, we talk about the absence of data sets, not being able to make judgments about what to do. This is absolutely critical. This transparency, this real-time information sharing isn't, a, isn't about political games or retribution. It's about keeping people safe. And so when you see a delay in information flowing from the Chinese Communist Party to the technical people who we wanted to get into China immediately to assist in this, every moment of delay connected to being able to identify this risk vector, the risk vectors, creates risk to the people all around the world. And so this is why it's not about blaming someone for this. This is about moving forward to make sure that we continue to have the information we need to do our jobs. Mr. Secretary, what, what message do you think it sends to other countries when you have the President of the United States lashing out at reporters? I, I've had my frustration with reporters, too. All I ask when I talk to the media is that you listen to what we say and report it accurately. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating when you see, when you see, when you see that that doesn't happen. It's, it's enormously frustrating. We have a responsibility to tell the American people the truth, and those who are reporting on what it is we're doing and saying have an equal responsibility to report accurately. But what message does it send to countries when you're lashing out reporters? I've seen, I've seen many things at the State Department be reported wildly and accurately on, mul on multiple occasions, and I have spoken to those reporters about it each and every time, and I will continue to do so. Mr. President, uh, Senator Johnson has suggested. Well, I'd rather have if you could finish up with the Secretary. I of State. think I've worn him out, Mr. President. I, well, I'll, let me <laughs> ask everybody you both. Finish, Secretary let me of State. ask you both if that's all right, Mr. Secretary. Senator Johnson has suggested that you and the administration may be overreacting. He said we don't shut down our economy because tens of thousands of people die on the highways. We don't shut down our economies because tens of thousands of people die from the common flu. Uh, at worst, 3.4% of Americans will die from this uh, virus, he said. Uh, what do you say to people that have that view? That's 11 million people he's talking about. Well, I can just say the entire world is agreeing with us because they're all, they all have their choice and uh, everybody's doing the exact same thing. We want to shut it out and uh, we can do that and we'll see what happens in two weeks and three weeks. But uh, if we can save thousands of lives and even millions of lives potentially, you don't know where it goes, but you could be talking about millions of lives. So uh, if you look at the, the world, I mean, you have some very smart people in the world. You have some smart leaders in the world, and everybody's doing it the way we're doing it. I think we're doing a better job than uh, hopefully most, if not all. We're doing a very effective job, but we'll, we'll know better in 14 or 15 days. But, you know, you're talking about hundreds of thousands and maybe more than that numbers of people. And, uh, you know, we can bring our finances back very quickly. We can't bring the people back. Mr. 